Good morning everyone, good morning. This week is the portion of Re'e. The Torah teaches us the mitzvah of eating meat. That when you come into the land of Israel, now God will permit you to eat the meat. Verse number 20. One second. Rabbi, we can't hear anything. Your, Rabbi, you're muted. Okay. Arlene, Arlene, Okay, we'll start again. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. The portion of Re'e speaks about the mitzvah of eating meat. In verse number 30, it says, Ki yarchiv Hashem malikecha is gavulcha. When God will widen your domain, and you will say, I want to eat meat, then you should eat according to how much you want. Says Rashi here, two interpretations. Number one, ki yarchiv. Over here, the first Rashi. What does that mean? Lim de Torah The Torah is teaching us derecheres, the proper rule for life. adam lechel basar rachavas yedayim that only if you could afford it should you eat meat. But if not, you could also eat carrots and peas and vegetables. You don't have to eat meat every day. This is the first Rashi. And this is based on the word Kiyarchiv. Only when you have the ability, because your, your money situation has expanded and you could afford it. Then the Rashi goes on to say, "Bechol avas nafshecha, avo ba midbar nesel lehem besar chulin." Says Rashi that in the midbar, in the desert, the Jewish people were not allowed to eat meat. Ella imkain magdisha makriva shalomim unless they brought it for a sacrifice. But normally, they were not allowed to eat meat. They had manna from heaven every single day. Came down manna, and that's what they ate. Now this is the opinion of Rashi and Rashi's commentary here on the Chumash. It's interesting to note that in the Tractate of Chulim, page 16, side B, there's actually a machlokis, there are two opinions between Rabbi Shemuel and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Shemuel says that in the Midbar, in the desert, they were not allowed to eat meat. And that is the opinion of Rashi. Rashi quotes Rabbi Shemuel. But you also have the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva says that in the desert, they were allowed to eat meat. However, in the desert, they did not shech the meat. They had no obligation to slaughter the meat ritually. However, what is the Torah teaching us here? When you come into the land of Israel, then you have the mitzvah to do shechita. You have the obligation to slaughter the animal. So, according to Rabbi Shemuel, when you come into the land of Israel, there was a leniency. You could have meat. According to Rabbi Akiva, there was a stringency. And that is that you can only eat meat if you do shechita. So, in other words, Rabbi Akiva is now strict. He's saying you must slaughter the meat in order to eat it. Now, how do we understand these two opinions? What is the reason that Abi Akiva says that they were allowed to eat meat in the desert? However, they did not need to slaughter the meat. And what is the concept of Rabbi Shmuel saying that you should not eat meat even in the desert? Now, the halacha is actually like Rabbi Akiva. We state that in the desert, the Jews were allowed to eat meat. 
but they did not have to actually perform the ritual slaughter of the Shechita. Furthermore, it says in the Torah, when God will widen your domain and you will want to eat meat, why? Because your soul will desire meat. Since when does the soul desire meat? It should have said the body will want to eat meat. Why did it say the soul will desire the meat? What does it mean here that the soul will desire the meat? And then he goes on to say that you're not allowed to eat blood. You have to pour the blood onto the ground. What's the concept over here of pouring the blood on the ground? It's true that blood is prohibited, that a Jew is not allowed to eat blood, and therefore we, we salt all the meat before we eat it. But what is the concept of pouring the blood onto the ground? Now we know when we bring a, a sacrifice in the Holy Temple, we take the blood and we spray the blood and we sprinkle the blood onto the altar. So why, when it comes to a sacrifice, do we pour the blood onto the altar? Yet, when we're eating meat because our soul desires it, says the Torah, we have to pour it onto the ground. So how do we understand all of these things? We spoke many times the difference between the Jewish people in the desert and the approach in the land of Israel. In the desert, primarily, they received every day manna from heaven. They lived a very spiritual life. As the Bachia explains that by the fact that they had the manna from heaven, it actually elevated them to a level of angels. They had the angelic ability to understand Torah, the knowledge of Torah, on a very deep level. And this is why the Talmud says that the Torah was only given to the generation that ate the manna because to understand that godly wisdom in a finite material body is a very difficult thing. And so the manna refined us and gave us the ability to understand and comprehend the Torah. However, it was a generation of spirituality. When we came into the land of Israel, the entire apparatus changed. We had a different prescription, a different regimen. And that was to elevate the physical and make it spiritual. It was a different avodah, a different service to Hashem. And that is called the avodah habirudim, the service and the, the regimen of elevating the sparks. And this is primarily by the fact that we get involved in the everyday business world. That we, we sow the land, we plow the land. We work the land, we harvest the land, we build the physical houses of stone and brick. In the desert, they had tents. There was no physical houses of stone and brick, but rather temporary houses. In contrast to the land of Israel, where there were permanent houses. In Israel, there was wars. They had to conquer the land. In the desert, primarily, there was peace. It was a different lifestyle totally. And because of the different regimen and because of the different prescription and responsibility of the Jewish people, therefore the obligation to eat or not to eat meat comes into play. Therefore says Rabbi Shmuel that in the desert the Jewish people did not eat meat because there was no obligation to elevate the physical and make it spiritual. You had already spiritual bread. It was a spiritual approach to life and that was the lifestyle that they lived. It was only when you enter into the land of Israel should one get involved with the physical and is one permitted to be involved with the physical and therefore we are given additional strength spiritually to be able to elevate the physical. And that is the meaning Kiyarchi, when God will enlarge your land, which means spiritually God will give you additional spiritual power to be able to elevate the physical and make it spiritual. This also explains why Adam was not allowed to eat meat, Adam and Eve in paradise, because their responsibility was spirituality. It was only after the flood, when now the job was to elevate the physical world, that Noah was given the mitzvah and the opportunity to be able to eat meat. Because at that time, 
they had the responsibility to elevate the physical. And the same is true with the Jewish people in the desert and in the land of Israel. In the desert, it was like Adam and Eve in paradise. Israel was like Noah after the flood. And because of this, they were given additional strength, kiyachiv. God widened their, their strength, their reach, to be able to elevate the physical and make it spiritual. However, says the Torah, the reason why you are eating the meat in the land of Israel is because your soul desires it, because your soul understands its mission. The soul understands why it is brought down to the world, and that is to make a dwelling place for God, to bring peace and harmony amongst all nations, to teach the seven Noahide laws, to live the seven Noahide laws, to live the 613 commandments of the Torah, and to transform the physical and make that spiritual. And therefore we are given additional strength when we enter into the land of Israel. And the soul knows this. Therefore, Kitav and Afshecha, the soul is desiring the meat. However, says the Torah, you have to pour the water, the blood onto the ground like water. Why? Because blood represents passion, represent, represents desire, represents temptation. When you eat the meat, you should take the iron, you should take the, the strength, you should take the vitamins of the meat and use it to serve God and elevate that. But the passion, the sizzle of the steak, is something you have to pour onto the ground. Don't eat it because you, physically as a human being, as a homo sapien, desires the animal. No, but rather it's because of your soul. Your soul wants to elevate the physical meat. So when it comes to a sacrifice in the Holy Temple, that the meat is brought up to God, here we say you can take the blood and you are to pour it onto the altar. Why? Because that is where your passion should be. That is where your desires should be. That is where your entire essence should be, to connect with God and spirituality. But when you're eating the meat for yourself, when you're eating the meat on your own, then, says the Torah, you shall pour it onto the ground. Do not eat the meat with this temptation, with this desire, with this passion. Now, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shmuel differ pertaining to the approach in the desert. Rabbi Shmuel says the desert was totally spiritual. Rabbi Akiva says even though the prescribed regimen of the Jewish people in the desert was spiritual, however, they had permission to elevate the meat as well, but this was not the standard. This was not the general approach. And furthermore, they did not have the, the ultimate ability to truly transform the meat, but they had somewhat of a power to elevate it, but not totally. And that is why Rabbi Akiva says they did not slaughter the meat. They did not shech the meat. They did not spiritually sever the meat as the Torah prescribes. Why? Why not? Because the concept of shechita, the concept of ritual slaughter is to elevate the meat. Ein v'shochat el u'moshach. Says the Gemara, the purpose of slaughter is to draw the animal from the public domain to the private domain. From the public domain represents the general everyday world. The private domain represents the domain of God, where it is clear that there's only one ruler, there's only one power, and there's a supreme being, which is Almighty God. In the desert, they did not have the ability to totally transform this meat to the private domain to Almighty God. It was only after they entered into the land of Israel that they now had the full capacity, the full strength to slaughter the meat, to transform the meat, the physical, and truly elevate all the sparks onto Almighty God. And therefore... Rabbi Akiva believed that even though meat was permissible in the desert, there was no obligation for shechita, no obligation for ritual slaughter. Rashi, as we said earlier, brings down the opinion of Rabbi Shmuel that in the Midbar, in the desert, they did not eat meat. And he also brings down the opinion when you enter into the land of Israel and you become wealthy, then you are able to eat the meat. How do you understand this on a daily basis? Our rabbis tell us that in the morning, 
you are like the desert. In the afternoon, you are like the land of Israel. What does that mean? In the morning, when you get up, God first returns your soul. You are supposed to be spiritual. The first thing you do is you pray, you daven. Then you learn Torah. From the synagogue, you go to the yeshiva. It doesn't mean you have to be enrolled in a yeshiva. It doesn't mean you have to know Hebrew. But each person every day has a schedule. The schedule is we get up, we pray to God. After we pray to God, we learn Torah. How long do you pray for? There are those who pray for five minutes. There are those who pray for an hour or two. But every morning you pray. After you finish praying, you study Torah. How long do you study Torah? You can study Torah for two, three hours. Or you can study Torah for 10, 20 minutes. But every day, that is the schedule. That is the regimen. From prayer to the study of Torah. Once we do this, we have now finished our job in the desert. We now enter into the everyday business world, the ordinary, physical, mundane world. Now our regimen changes. We have the obligation of elevating sparks. We have the obligation to transform the physical into the spiritual. But when can we eat meat? Only Only when God will widen your borders, which means after we receive the energy from the morning prayers, after we receive the energy from the morning Torah study, we have now the capacity, we have the tools, we have the ammunition to be able to eat meat, to be able to transform the physical and make it spiritual. That's why really one should not eat a big breakfast before davening. Only if you need to, if you're weak, if you're sick. But really, the idea of elevating the sparks, elevating the food, comes about after prayers. There were many great sages that did not eat meat until the evening. Only after a full day of, of Torah study, of prayer, when they widened their boundaries, when they were able to acquire additional energy to transform the physical and make it spiritual. Adam, Adam, and Chava, and Eve in the Garden of Eden did not have that obligation. And therefore they were not given that strength. Though Adam was greater than the angels, though Adam was very holy, and he had brilliance greater than King Solomon, yet he had no permission to eat the meat, because that was not his regimen, that was not his responsibility. <clears throat> it was only after entering into the physical world, after the flood of Noah, did the world receive additional strength to transform the physical. And the same is true after we enter into the land of Israel, after we enter into the everyday world, after already we were prepared through prayer and Torah study, now comes along the Torah and says, you are allowed to eat meat. You are given additional space. You are given additional power. However, remember, pour the blood on to the ground. Why do you eat the meat? Why do you get involved with business? Why do you make a lot of money? Not that you can walk around arrogantly and haughty and say, I have more money than you, but rather to use those sparks to build houses of worship, to use those sparks to build hospitals and orphanages and to help people in need. That is the way we create a dwelling place for God in this world. This is the insight and this is the meaning of the parasha of Re'e. I want to also conclude with a story or two of Rabbi Steinsaltz. As you know that uh, this past week, Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz passed away, a great, great Torah scholar who translated the entire Talmud into Hebrew and later it was translated into English. And similarly, he translated the entire Tanya, the magna opus of Rab Shnei Zaman of the Adi and uh, Chabad philosophy into Hebrew and he explained many, many parts of the Tanya. So Rabbi Adin Steinzals, being a genius and, and a great commentator, passed away this week. I had the privilege of meeting him on numerous occasions. And one of the occasions that I met him was a Shabbos in Jerusalem. It was at the Bar Mitzvah of my younger brother. My father worked it out with the Gabbai of the synagogue that I should give the speech that morning in the Tzemach Sedek synagogue in Yerushalayim Iratika in the old city of Jerusalem. 
And the official rabbi of that synagogue was Rabbi Steinsaltz. And so I gave a drasha, a very powerful speech. I prepared very, very well. And I remember, thank God, that God blessed me that the words came out perfectly and people there were very inspired. At the end of the talk, after davening, after services, I see Rabbi Steinzal sitting in the corner. He used to sit in the corner and he goes like this to me. He calls me over. I walk over to Rabbi Steinzaltz. I said, Rabbi Steinzaltz, Rabbi Evan Yisrael, the Rebbe gave him a new name, the Stone of Israel. And the Rebbe called him Evan Yisrael. And I walk over to the Rabbi, Rabbi Evan Yisrael. I said, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Evan Yisrael, it's an honor to be here this morning. He says, yes, I want to tell you, I was very impressed with your talk this morning. It was very beautiful. However, I want to tell you one thing. If it would have been a bit shorter, it would have been even better. Those were his words to me. He was a sharp rabbi, a sharp man. And his point was as follows, that there is quality and there is quantity. And we need to bring the quality into the quantity. In other words, we are living in a time of a pandemic. It's very difficult to communicate one with the other. You go to the synagogue, you go to a house of worship, you have to wear a mask. You see people in the street, you're wearing a mask. You can't really talk and communicate. We need to choose our words wisely. We need to be able to communicate many ideas in very few words. And therefore, he said to me, if it would have been a bit shorter, it would have been even better. And so, my dear friends, this is the message of the week. Try to choose your words. Try to think before you speak at least two or three times, which is the reason, by the way, why we have teeth and we have lips, two guards over our mouth, to think once and think twice and to try to make our words effective and to impact other people and to inspire other people and to choose words that are uplifting, not God forbid words that can destroy and are condescending. So to wish everybody an amazing week, a blessed week. And we should truly see the blessing of all of these additional blessings that God gives us every single day to widen the land, to bring additional wealth to us materially and spiritually so that we can truly fulfill our mission in this world of transforming darkness into light, transforming pandemic into redemption, and bringing about peace for the entire world. Have an amazing day. God bless you. Baruch HaVatzlocha. To wish everybody a happy and healthy, sweet new year. As you know, it's customary at this time already in your emails, in your texts, in your WhatsApps, in your social media, in your communication, even over an old-fashioned telephone, to conclude with the words to be written and to be sealed for a happy and healthy, sweet new year. Thank you for joining.